Hi there, I'm Skaji, a practicing witch and a professional tarot nerd. I'm glad you're here. Our vocabulary word this week is the fool's journey. Okay, that's three words. But when it comes down to the tarot, it's one idea. Well, that's not really right either. It's a lot of ideas. But let's just agree that it's a concept and we'll take it from there. The fool's journey as it applies to the tarot is, well, it's the journey of the fool. And the fool in this case is us, each of us, as we pass through our lives. If we want to get weird and deep with it, the fool's journey is a path to enlightenment, to understanding, whatever that means. Dearly beloved, we have gathered here today to get through this thing called life. In the Fool's Journey, we, as represented by the Fool card, have ourselves an adventure as we pass through the lessons of each of the other cards in the deck. The earliest reference I can find to this idea is a poem from 1527. Well, it's a bunch of poems, actually, by Teofilo Folingo, writing as Merlinus Cocainus in Caus del Triperuno. I've probably butchered every single one of those words. This, uh, this may also be the first written record of divination by cards. Um, Falingo was writing about um, tarot key cards, but we'll take that as close enough. In that collection of sonnets, the characters pass through a series of challenges, each named after one of the tarot key cards. At least that's what the internet tells me, because I don't read Italian. Another approach to the fool's journey wears a more noble name tag. In Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey is detailed in which a heroic figure passes through a series of challenges, and getting aid here and there along the way until he succeeds in his grand quest. Now, every example of the fool's journey I've ever seen is really just a story. When we're in the process of living, it might be hard to see, but we're really just living our own story. The Fool's Journey, when we look at the tarot through that lens, can help us out by providing some insight into the challenges facing us, and we might even find some unexpected assistance. Our card this week is The Fool. You may have seen that coming. The Fool was suggested by my dear friend Mark. I'm not sure, but I, th I think he may have been trying to tell me something. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to start our discussion with the fool with a quote from William Blake, a thoroughly weird and brilliant artist, poet, and religious satirist. In Europe, a prophecy published by Blake himself in his house, of all places, in 1794, he writes, If a man would persist in his folly, he would become wise. Now, if I were a bold and adventurous fool, I would edit this to be, if one survives one's folly, only then does one become wise. Hold my beer. Watch this. Now, let's get a couple of things out of the way. Just because the card may say fool right there on it doesn't always mean foolishness and shenanigans are afoot. I mean, it can mean foolishness and shenanigans. Hold my beer. Watch this. But the fool is so much more than that. In the fool is the potentiality of every other card in the deck. And like so many things in life, there's more than one kind of fool. Here in this Marseille-style reproduction from 1969, we see an earlier version of the fool. The Marseille style of decks developed around Marseille, that's in France, in the 1700s. And in this card, we see a fellow who's not having the best of days. I mean, damn dog tore his pants. And also in this card, we see the, the Traveler, which becomes a template for so many later decks. The Fool has been known in French as La Fou, in Italian as Il Matto, and in German as Der Nar. Now, all of these do translate as Fool, but there's also a streak of crazy in there, too. We all have that one friend who's a bit unpredictable and unhinged. I'm looking at you, Mr. Jenkins. And if you don't have that kind of friend, you probably are that friend. 
If we think about it, that friend has been a part of a lot of people's lives all over the world and throughout history. It was even a job at one time. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio, a man of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. That's some Shakespeare for you. Hamlet, Act 5, Scene 1. Heard of court jesters? I imagine that was a stressful job. I mean, you do get to poke fun at authority, and that's always a hoot, until said authority decides that you took it a little bit too far. And clowns. Everybody loves a clown, right? To be honest, I, I think I've met more people who don't like clowns than them that do. But clowns do go back a long way. They were buffooning their way around stages in ancient Greece and Rome. And in several Native American cultures, we have sacred clowns. And these religious characters serve to turn over the typical social order as a way of pointing out shortcomings and conflicts within the community. At least, that's my uneducated take on it. I'm sure there's a lot more nuance to it than just that. And punks as a cultural movement. Punks in many ways serve, albeit in more leather and with more mohawks, to point out societal shortcomings. All these things illustrate one thing to me, that we humans have always had a need to turn things upside down and challenge the BS we see before us. Another kind of fool is less dramatic. This fool is simply an adventurer. Clues might be in short supply, but that doesn't matter to our intrepid adventurer. He's just excited to see what's around the next corner, over the next hillside, and maybe it'll be a little smackering of something. My favorite icon for this kind of fool is that iconic bear of very little brain. You know, the one in the red shirt and no pants. He may not know what's going on, but he never lets that stop him. As far as the cards go, the fool is a bit of an oddball, naturally. Number zero, asked the fool. Kind of hard to figure out where they fit, right? Is it at the beginning of the majors? Well, I suppose so, if you're using the fool's journey as your template. Oswald Worth, a fellow tarot nerd from the 19th century, put the fool both before and after the majors. He did that by circling the majors up, kind of like this. Now, Worth uh, never included the minors, that silly goose. You could even get a little dow with it and put the blank slate, the fool, at the end of the journey. Can you imagine a, a Taoist missionary? Good afternoon. Are you familiar with the dow? It means the way. Are you one with the universe? Who would you like to be? Sorry about that, I can't help myself. So that number zero, it really opens up the fool to all kinds of things. The number zero really hasn't been around all that long. There's a link to a video in the description if you're interested in nothing. Nothing, the tabula rasa, the blank slate. These are all fool things. But our symbol for zero is a circle. And circles just kind of keep going and going and going, kind of like that thing Worth did with the cards. The Fool's Journey can be seen as the, the path that never ends. It just keeps going, dear friends. Some people started following it, not knowing what it was, and they'll just keep following it just because it's the path that never ends. And speaking of paths, in the Kabbalah, the Fool is associated with the 11th path on the Tree of Life, between Kether, the crown, and Chokma, wisdom. Kether, there at the top of the tree, represents the ultimate source of reality, however you choose to interpret that. So the fool's path is between that source and wisdom. Now you might think that the fool should be further down on the tree, closer to our material world, needing to work his way up. But that path up there at the top really is the path of that silly old bear, the wisdom of the blank slate. Here in the Rider-Waite-Smith 
fool, we, we move away from that destitute vagabond that we saw in the Marseille style deck. This guy's kind of fancy, right? He's packed him up a few things in that little bag and off he goes. And his little doggo buddy there really wishes the fool would pay attention to where he was going. Many fool cards feature a critter friend for the fool and many of them seem to be suggesting that falling off a cliff might not be the best idea. Many times during readings that I'm performing, that little doggo shows up representing a seeker's own intuition, which they might not listen to as often as they should. And sometimes our critter companion shows up to remind the seeker that they have spirits who have a thing or two to say. That flower right there, that white rose, that's part of the blank slate symbolism. That's innocence. The sun up there in the sky, is it a rising sun or a setting sun? Most of the time, it feels sunrisey, sort of the beginning of a day, the beginning of a journey. But when that card is feeling foolish, it can have that sundown kind of feeling, a feeling of endings. And check this out. He's got himself a designer bag, and it looks like it's got a bird on there to me. Elementally, at least according to the Golden Dawn, a fool is associated with the element of air. Well, that's a birdie kind of thing, right? In the Robin Wood Tarot, we get a lot of the same imagery that we found in the Rider Waite Smith card, but there are a couple of differences with this one. One, we don't see the sun. We don't really know what kind of day it is. This takes that fool out of time. Right? They become kind of timeless. And the butterflies here represent transformation. The transformations coming for the fool during all of those adventures they're about to have. Now, I'll admit, I've always thought caterpillars would be better symbols on a fool card. After all, they haven't transformed yet. But it's probably hard to get a caterpillar on a card effectively. And this fool is, is a musician. He's just whistling away there. And that speaks to a sort of inner joy. And you may have felt this yourself if you're one of those who loves belting out your favorite song in the car or in the shower or in the middle of the grocery store. I got a lot of strange looks that day. In the Urban Tarot by Robin Scott, we get a different take on the fool. The artist modeled for this card himself, standing on top of his apartment building. Now don't worry, he did have a friend holding on to his belt, safety first. And the dog you see there wasn't on the roof with him at all. Here the fool is paying attention to the precipice on which he stands. He's well aware of the danger. In the guidebook, the author writes, I strive to live a life unburdened by fear, open to the possibilities before me. And he goes on to quote uh, a favorite quote of his from Neil Gaiman. It is sometimes a mistake to climb. It is always a mistake never even to make the attempt if you do not climb, you will not fall. This is true. But is it that bad to fail, that hard to fall? Sometimes, when you fall, you learn to fly. Now, I have a similar favorite quote from Ray Bradbury, taken from a speech he delivered to Brown University. If we listened to our intellect, we'd never have a love affair. We'd never have a friendship. We'd never go in business because we'd be cynical. It's going to go wrong. Or she's going to hurt me. Or I've had a couple of bad love affairs, so therefore, well, that's nonsense. You're going to miss life. You've got to jump off cliffs all the time and build your wings on the way down. And let's not forget the inimitable wisdom of Mr. Douglas Adams. There is an art, it says, or rather a knack to flying. The knack lies in learning how to throw yourself at the ground and miss. Clearly, it is this second part, the missing, which presents the difficulties. In the Hush Tarot by Jeremy Hush, we diverge from more traditional images. Here we have a ferret friend with some moths hanging out. The, the author uses critters and their behavior to very effectively represent the messages of the cards. I understand um, that ferrets are often playful, curious, and mischievous. All of these are traits represented by the fool. I like those traits. I still play with crayons. Downside, though, 
is that there are things in life which do require serious attention. Not every challenge can be faced with a joke and a smile. The moths represent the indirect path the fool's journey can take. You ever seen a moth fly? I don't think they know anything about straight lines. Downside for our moth friends are that they are drawn at times to the very thing that will burn them up. Of all the fool cards I've seen, I think this one from the Wildwood Tarot is my favorite. They've renamed this card the Wanderer, and it does sort of take that fool edge off of things. In this card, our friend isn't carrying anything. Their hands are empty and outstretched, ready to receive whatever may come their way. And we can't see their face. They're taking a path away from us. Could that be because we're following them? Or maybe we are them, and it's our own face we can't see. Our own potential. We talk about faith. I imagine it would take quite a bit of faith to walk on that rainbow. But I'm sure they'll be just fine as long as they don't look down. Here in the Pulp Tarot by Todd Alcott, we get a different fool. The one who is really terribly excited about her jog. This fool card has a more foolish kind of feel to me. And, and sometimes the lessons we learn and learn best don't come from making the best decisions. Sometimes experience comes from making bad decisions. Survive and grow wise. Hold my beer. Watch this. Our tarot fool can remind us of our humanity and call us out on our own BS, just as jesters, sacred clowns, and with a shout and a sneer, punks. And the fool can remind us that sometimes, just sometimes, the path to adventure is best trod as the tabula rasa, the blank slate. Oh, bother. This one was a lot of fun. I'm sure you can tell that The Fool is one of my favorite cards. Thanks, Mark. And thank you for spending some of your time with me today. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please like, subscribe, comment, share. I'm Skaji. Safe journeys.